uh, schedule this week. Uh, normally our stewardship finance ministry is on the first Monday, but tomorrow's Labor Day, so we're going to do property on Tuesday at 6 and stewardship and finance at 7 on Tuesday. So uh, please note that change in our typical schedule and stuff. So now it's time to go and uh, hear God's word. We're studying the Psalms, and today we're to Psalm 37. And uh, the title I gave Lisa when I was working on the bulletin at the end of the week, uh, at the beginning of the week, was the righteous life, but it really changed into the question, whose side is God on, uh, the good or the evil? And in many ways, this is an answer to what we looked at last week. Last week we looked at Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord, how long will you let harsh things go on in my life and in the world? And that was a plea of uh, despair. And uh, the, the good news is God's there to help us in times when things are really harsh and stuff. And this psalm, Psalm 37, today picks up on that and gives even more answer to it uh, as we go into God's presence. Let's pray to hear his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds to hear your word uh, and that we might not just be hearers but doers of it, le letting the light and love of Jesus shine through us. His name we pray. Amen. So Psalm 37, a long psalm. We're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to go through uh, verse 29 here today. Uh, it actually has 40 verses, but uh, this gets the whole flavor of it here. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Oh, let me explain a little bit here. This psalm in Hebrew is an acrostic. Each verse or each stanza begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We don't get that in our English, but that's the way it's structured. I am, uh, beta, gimel, dalet, on down to the, uh, through the Hebrew alphabet. And it's done mostly in two verse stanzas, though uh, there is one three verse stanza in it. So I've tried to break it kind of like that on the slides. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, and the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. Those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever living generously and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice, he will not forsake his saints. 
They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. And it continues from there, echoing the same thing even further. May God add it to our understanding this morning. And for our New Testament reading, we're looking at Romans chapter 12. And I can read, I'll read the first couple of verses, and then there's a list of commands at the end. Uh, and uh, this is Paul's commands to us to show Christ-like character in all that we do. He says here in Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We'll skip a few verses that talk about spiritual gifts, and then Paul gives us some of the most direct, simple commands about how to show Christ-like character. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice. Hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Continue, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You get all those commands? A lot there in that passage. Both of these passages have a lot to say. Well, whose side is God on? Big question of life. Why do the wicked prosper and good people seem to suffer? Have y'all ever wrestled with that question? When you look out in the world, uh, you see the business tycoons, the Hollywood moguls, the recording industry stars, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the politicians. You see all these people, and many of them are fabulously wealthy and live opulent lifestyles, but many of them are moral, morally reprehensible. Not all of them. There are a few exceptions out there, but the exceptions are more rare than uh, the ones who live uh, lies that we actually hold in disdain. Recently, we've had some of the Me Too scandals and things like that. Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Jeffrey Epstein. There's a website that lists 263 male celebrities who have been accused of sexual assault since 2017. A few of these are even preachers from big churches. Bill Hybels, who led the Willow Creek Community Church to become the largest church in our country at one point is on that list, and he's had to leave in scandal and shame because of his behavior. So uh, even sometimes God's people are not immune from all this. Well, believers see all this and see all these people who seem to get wealthy and, and stuff uh, in spite of their bad behavior, and we fret and ponder. The word fret here means to worry uh, or uh, to be uh, frightened over. So and we ask, why are these people blessed Materially, in so many ways, with wealth and fame and glamour and all those things that the world tells us we really need. Not just the people in Hollywood. Why do drug lords and evil cartels seem to flourish? Uh, why does evil rise up in so many different places? We say, I try to do everything right and I can hardly hold my head above water financially and otherwise. That's how we respond as God's people so we can all understand the feeling of those who wonder why this is going on. 
Well, Psalm 37 is written as an answer to all these concerns. It addresses all these questions and assures us that uh, uh, not the world is not as unfair as it seems, that God is looking over everything and is going to render his judgment and, and, and blessings according to those who live in his will. Uh, it tells us not to get worked up or worried over the disparities of this world. Any income inequality is not in our spiritual agenda. Might be a political question out there, but for God's people, that's not what we wrestle with. Now, Psalm 37 is a wisdom psalm that assures us that the good path in life is the valid path in life. And we're just going to look through some of the verses here today, kind of a Bible study fashion, which we normally do anyway, but do that even a little more today, because they just simply stand out there and tell us that God is with us and for us, and we need to stand on the right side. That's why we don't need to worry because of evil doers in the world. Let's look at the first four verses here. Fret not the cause yourself the cause of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. They will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. God is going to bring justice. That's right there in that first verse, uh, or in second verse. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Evil will fade like the grass. Here's a way to illustrate it. Evil work, evildoers, and workers of iniquity will soon be cut down like grass. Therefore, we can trust in the Lord. God's going to meet out his justice and uh, vengeance in due time. We don't have to take care of this. Uh, and this is what uh, we can celebrate. First of all, there's promises to God's people. Verse 10, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in the abundant of peace. Where have you heard something like, but the meek shall inherit the land? There's another famous Bible verse in the New Testament that picks up on that. The Beatitudes. Uh, the meek shall inherit the land and enjoy great peace is a lot like, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the Beatitudes, all those blessings there. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are spiritually poor, they shall um, inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And also in there is blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. And the meek are those who are humble and uh, kind and gentle, not weak, but they choose not to react in anger and viciousness at other people around them. It's the opposite of the bullies of the world. And so uh, God wants us to be on the meek side. And so that's what we celebrate here. But the meek shall inherit the land or the earth, whichever version you want to have there. Verses 27 to 29. Turn away from evil and do good so that you shall dwell forever. Those who really do good are the ones that last longer in the long run. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, picking up on that theme again, and dwell upon it forever. God is on our side, and his reward will come in due time. Also, uh, the flip side of that is God's going to judge the wicked. There are people who do evil in the world. Of course, right now the world is turned upside down and what used to be considered good, like chastity and morality and uh, uh, traditional marriage and uh, uh, preserving life and things like that, that's now considered evil in some respects and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, corruption in the world is now exalted as something good. But we know God is going to settle this in, in his own time and place. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth against them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows that their, his day, their day is coming. So God knows that sooner or later it's all going to turn around and the wicked will be punished. That's verses 12 and 13 and verses 16 and 7. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds. Isn't it reassuring to hear God's word that he's with us and for us and on the right side? That's the point of this psalm. It's not telling us something we really don't already know, 
but it's there for us to hear and meditate on and know that God has his standards and he wants us to be on the positive. Now the Old Testament and New Testament are built on the fact that, as we are discussing here, that God loves the righteous. And the righteous are those who seek to please God and live by his commands, not the ways of the world. The world wants to turn all this upside down and make God's people look bad and the evil people look heroic or virtuous and stuff. But that's not how it really needs to be. There's a sharp divide in the Bible. The spirit versus the flesh is light versus darkness, righteous versus unrighteous, North Carolina versus NC State. You can debate that one. I won't determine which one's the good side and which one's the bad side because some of you all will debate on that one. So, uh, but we're into football season, so now we can get into arguments about stuff like that rather than all these other moral arguments. But God promises to bless and keep one side, those who live according to his ways. God tries to redeem the other side. God loves the sinners in the world, and he sent Jesus to die for them. We were once there, many of us, but we've come around and have joined God's team, but God wants the rest of them to come over to his team, and that's what he's trying to do in his work in the world. And that's the point of our church and the other churches in our community, trying to bring those out of the darkness into the light. Well, Romans 12 tells us how to move over to the right side and how to live in the light of uh, Jesus. It describes godly character uh, uh, in full detail uh, of what it means to, to live as a follower of Jesus. Now, Romans 12 follows 11 handy chapters of doctrine and theology in the letter of Romans. And then Paul ends all that and says, okay, let's apply this now. And this is where he begins to say all this doctrine about salvation and predestination and uh, uh, total depravity and all that kind of stuff that's in the rest of Romans, this is what it results in. He turns around and says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual worship. This is the first step of reformation. And uh, we present our bodies to God. Now, a sacrifice is only given to God. Once it's put on the altar and sacrificed, uh, it can't be taken back or partially given. And so if we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, we are in God's hands, and uh, we no longer claim authority over our own lives. And we all have, have, to, have to be all in for Jesus and building his church, God's kingdom. So that's where it all begins. Present bodies as a living sacrifice. The next one is do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a butterfly here. It's a caterpillar to butterfly transformation. Metamorphosis is the word in Greek. And we use that in biology as well. It's a spiritual term as well as a biological term that we are transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. And of course, we do this by reprogramming our minds. We are like computers that have crashed. We need to remove the old operating system and install a new one. And we take out the world's operating system and plug in uh, the Christian operating system, and therefore we can look and act and serve uh, in a new way. And then the third step is to be uh, open to living as students of God's word, applying all that he has in his commands here. And this is where all this list of commands comes up in Romans 12. Uh, boom, with the, in grammatical terms, these are all called imperatives, just simple, direct commands. There's usually no subject, it's just action stated, active uh, uh, response here, not a passive. Um, we are kind of like God's roadside mechanics, going out into the world looking for people that need to be fixed up. And the Bible's full of these kinds of commands coming up, uh, not only in Romans 12. The golden rule is one of the key ones. What does the golden rule tell us? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's an active thing. Don't sit back and wait for others. You go and fix the world yourself. Uh, the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then Romans 12, we hear, it picks up with this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. 
Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, is that easy stuff to do? It's simple to understand, but it's easy to do. No, it, these are the challenges that we face every day, that we return, uh, we're trying to break the cycle of evil in the world, where people persecute us, put down Jesus, put down Christian values, put down the ways of the Lord. Uh, we've got to stand up to that. We take the abuse, we bless, we do not curse, uh, we uh, hold fast to what is good, we love one another with brotherly affection, and try to outdo one another uh, uh, in showing honor. Here's uh, some of the earlier other portions of this. Uh, be careful of, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Is it just picking up the air? If possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. He will meet this out. He will take care of all these things. So, this brings us to our conclusion. You want God on your side? Well, first you have to choose to be on his side. Give your mind and body and soul to Jesus, and he will re renew them and make them whole. Then we'll walk in the ways of Jesus every day in the world. Reprogram your mind with regular exposure to God's word, and he will regenerate you and retrain you and get you to live in the ways that make a difference. This is something I saw this past week and posted on Facebook that I think is a great way to say the same thing that this whole passage is about. It's called, Be That One. Be that one who forgives when deep offense has been committed. That one who loves when no one else does. That one who gives kindness to those who are mean. Be that one who looks past the insult, instead seeing the pain that motivated it. That one who shines light upon those who sit in utter darkness. Be, because the impact of being that one runs far and wide. It brings healing to the world, joy to the sad, and hope to those in, in despair. Be that one. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be that one. That one person who can make a difference in our school, in our community community, in our workplace, uh, in our church where reconciliation needs to be brought, Lord, help us to be that one who pushes aside harshness and evil and darkness and lives in the light and love of the risen Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Continue to strengthen and guide us and help us to lean on the everlasting arms of Jesus as we work through all these things in our lives in the world. We pray in his name and for his glory. by standing and singing, leaning on the everlasting arms. We can't do this by our strength. Leaning on Jesus is how we are safe and secure from all alarms and get the strength to live to his light in the world. 575, leaning on the everlasting arms.